Okay, yeah, well, uh, thank you everybody for coming out uh, this evening for what will hopefully be uh, uh, a fascinating evening uh, readings and discussions around this idea of uh, short story and research. Um, my name is Rob Page, I'm uh, part of the uh, Comma Press team, we're all at the back. If you're not familiar with Comma, uh, we're based in Manchester and we specialise in short story and we kind of celebrate what, we, what you can do with a short story, both as writers and, and as editors uh, that you can't do with other forms. Um, write what you know is kind of the first evening of uh, creative writing courses. Write about what you know and know your subject matter intimately, personally, fundamentally. Is what uh, creative writing teachers are always telling <coughs> young, uh, new students and new writers uh, to, to grasp. But with the short story comes another opportunity, perhaps even an obligation, which is to do what the short story can do better than perhaps any other literary form, which is explore, which is to go out into, uh, into new territory and to kind of leave your comfort zone and maybe even to trespass temporarily into the unfamiliar. And tonight um, we are, we're going to hear from two writers who have done both of those things really and have tried to reconcile the imperative to explore and to take on uh, new points of view and to go elsewhere with their writing, but also with this need to uh, possess and digest and know their material intimately. So we're going to hear from two different writers who have taken very, very, have taken the idea of research really to the extreme. Um, and although the subject matter of what they're reading about is very different, I think the process is very interesting in both cases. Uh, we're going to hear first of all from uh, Michelle Green, who uh, is putting together a book. Um, which is a collection of short stories based on, or derived from, her own personal experiences of uh, working as a humanitarian aid officer in uh, a, uh, a civil war, namely uh, the Darfur crisis, the Darfur civil war of uh, 2005, and uh, turning that into a collection of short stories which are entirely fictional. Uh, then we're going to hear from uh, Sarah Maitland, uh, who's launching this book tonight, which is uh, her first book with Comma, Although she's worked with us on individual stories over a long time, we're extremely <coughs> proud to have, to have brought this book to fruition through a, a series of commissions. And this book is a collection of 14 stories which are all based on conversations with scientists, uh, looking at, uh, discussing areas of expertise and knowledge and research which were all, to a certain extent, fairly unfamiliar uh, territory for, for Sarah. So, uh, and then after we we hear the two readings, we're going to have a little discussion. I'm going to start the ball rolling, but I do hope that you will uh, stick your hand up and ask some questions as well. Um, but as I say, yeah, first we're going to hear from uh, Michelle Green. Michelle is a writer that I've been familiar with, and if you're familiar with the Manchester writing scene, you may have heard her read in the past. Uh, she's a wonderful poet, uh, one of Manchester's greatest uh, poets, and uh, an amazing performer. Uh, she won the uh, Poetry Slam, the Northwest Poetry Slam back in 2005 and as a result uh, published a collection of uh, poetry with common word uh, called Knee High Affairs. Uh, but since her experience in Duffo she's been sort of moving slowly from poetry to prose uh, and it's an absolute pleasure to uh, introduce her. Please put your hands together. For <laughs> And um, I'm really, really pleased to be here with you, Sarah, as well. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing more about that book. Okay. Um, so I'm going to read you an excerpt from a story that um, kind of keeps getting bigger, <laughs> um, and it will be it will be in the collection that I'm writing at the moment. I should point out that um, I was working in Darfur in 2005, but the civil war is still ongoing. We just don't hear about it anymore. Um, so, uh, this story, I've chosen this one tonight because this is the most, I would say, research intensive um, in terms of me um, engaging with other people and seeking out experts, um, particularly around archaeology. Um, so, I'll read you the, uh, the excerpt and then I, I suppose maybe we can talk more about details later, if anyone is interested. Um, they're not in Darfur, they're in another part of Sudan. Um, the civil war is happening, 
and they're getting on with their, their work in the lower part of Sudan in the Sanar state, which is uh, like in the south, it's near South Sudan, uh, where the two Nile rivers, the White Nile and the Blue Nile, have not yet met. So Sanar is on the bank of the Blue Nile. And then uh, we've got across uh, to the other bank, in the middle there, there's this mountain called um, Jebel Moya. Um, it's it's very, very flat, and, and then there's this mountain comes up, and, it's, and it has a flat top. So, Henry Welcome, um, in 1911, he, um, took, he took a group of people there um, to, to excavate um, bodies on this, on this mountain top. Um, they were, I think they're about 2,000 years old. There's sort of a, an 800 year period where people, nomadic people in the area, were burying their dead on top of this mountain. Um, and we're sort of marking the trade routes um, across the borders of different empires. So, um, this is the imagined dig at the same site in the present day. Um, the narrator is Jude, that's who you're going to hear from, and she's an archaeological illustrator. I have to give you a lot of backstory because of this story being very long, and I'm giving you a chunk from near the end. <coughs> so please forgive my rambling. Um, her colleagues are Liam, Des, and her boss is Christine. So there's four archaeologists working on this site. Um, there's also a local man uh, from the village at the base of the mountain called Asif, and he has been assisting them in working as a laborer. Um, one acronym you need to know, I will mention NCAM, which is the National Corporation for Antiquities and Museums. Um, most countries have an equivalent. This is, this is the one in Sudan. Um, and so they're digging on this site and they've just discovered that uh, they've been told to speed it up because the site's going to be developed by a uh, mining company. There is uh, There has been gold found in this mountain. Um, I don't know if there are plans to mine it, but in my fictional world, that's what's happening now. Okay? So, um, I think that's all you need to know for now. <laughs> <laughs> And then he said to her, and then, I'll, just, I'll just read you this excerpt, and if you want to know more, then eventually I'll finish writing my book and you can read the whole thing. <laughs> okay, so here we go, we're jumping straight in, and this is from Jude. I remember my first museum trip. Mom and Dad took me, showed me the mummies, shelves full of old glass beads. In the morning, we walked through the main displays, all of the artifacts lined up with information cards on the side. The condensed origin stories. This piece was presented to, donated, acquired by. Near the end of the visit, we found a room to the side, a temporary exhibition of Victorian automata. Metal dolls with two small eyes stood among fairground rides and birds. There was loads of birds. Alongside these old robots was a newer machine that took up one whole end of the room. On the wall, a button marked with a sign in curling script Please press here. It began with the striking of a tall black grandfather clock. A long curtain drew back as music played from somewhere in the bowels of the machine. Levers pushed wheels which turned cranks, and from the base, a whole host of tin people rose. Masked revelers spun in bouffant dresses, shiny armor, all with elaborate animal heads. A raven danced with a fox. Among them ran clowns and musicians, twirling ballerinas. Near the front, a peacock fanned its tail. Each time the clock chimed, about every 30 seconds, the whole machine would jerk to a stop, the mechanical party goers freezing on the spot until the clock fell silent. As the midnight chime began, a figure rose from the center, tall and skeletal, dressed in black. Its face was pulled tight like a death mask with streaks of red sweeping down from the eye sockets. One of the creaky tin figures, bright in a gaudy clown, rose up and sped across the, the scene in chase of the tall skeletal man. As they reached the clock, the figure turned and his pursuer fell to the ground with a shrill cry. The guests ran forward, a surge of clanking metal and cogs, and at that, the skeletal man flew apart, piece by tin piece, red face last, pulled away by transparent threads. As he disintegrated, the party guests screeched and threw up their hands, their heads rolling back on their necks. The crimson light washed blood over the whole company. By the end, 
Every figure left was lying in a twisted heap of brightly colored tin, and for a long final 10 seconds, nothing moved. After the silence, a series of wheels and pulleys drew the velvet curtain across the whole terrible scene. The pieces cranked back into place, and I ran to start it again, holding my breath with the chimes on the long black clock. In the back of the vehicle, Liam keeps turning his hand, rotating his wrist until it clicks. The lens cover of my camera squeaks as it rustles <coughs> against my trousers. I hold my breath, count to 12 as I let it out. Des pulls over at the side of the road. Before us are a crowd of people and facing them, a group of bright new land cruisers. The mining reps are here, with a team of Sudanese bodyguards in unmarked fatigues. They stand back near their vehicles with their security men ahead, their guns pointing down. One of the reps talks on a sat phone, the silver case flashing as he turns. He finishes the call, slides the phone into a hip holster and glances over at us. To the side of the road are a few military-style tents, small ones, maybe eight men. This must be the beginnings of the military camp, or of the mining camp. A line of rocks the size of footballs blocks the road, and behind them stand men from the village, some linking arms, some stepping out to shove past bodyguards. Asif is there at the front with Sheikh Abir, talking with two of the NCAM staff, the ones that I met in Khartoum. Des and Christine step up to the security truck and I slip the lens cap from my camera and hold it out in front of me. I hit record, squint over it with my one good eye. Beside me, Liam clicks his wrist, one, two, and that's when the slip happens. The shape pushes past the end cam men and strides forward, and as if he's broken the skin on a spring pond, moved from the water to thin, dry air, his people follow, rushing into the space he's left empty. The shouting propels them. There are legs and there are bodies and then voices, and the mining men stepping back, their guards closing around them, arms up, and with them the rifles, and when it comes, the sound is so loud that I close my good eye too, involuntarily. So loud for that instant, and then the ringing like tinnitus, like an earplug pushed too far, and screaming. The screams, the people running, Liam grabbing me and pushing me down, the roar of an engine as it comes to life and then sees its cargo in reverse, away from the line of rocks. My camera was still recording when we got up minutes later. But I must have been leaning right over the mic because when I watched it back later that night in my tent, Liam beside me, all we can hear is the sound of ragged breathing and him repeating, okay, okay, okay. I can hardly hear the screams. Asif's funeral was held at the foot of the mountain on the east side near the village. The four of us waited at a distance and then brought food to the mourner's tent. We sat on the carpets holding small glasses of sweet coffee until they were cold and it was time for us to go. At our camp, Christine took the phone to the highest point and spent over an hour there. The red tip of her cigarette flickering signals as the evening drew in. She came back down as the last light leached away to the west. Shake up here has asked me to suspend our work in support, she said, and I've agreed. I'll be working with Enham and the Ministry to push for a full assessment of the site and an inquiry into the shooting. She looked around at each of us then, her usual steel-eyed gaze replaced with something heavier. You each have your own decision to make on this. Of course, I said, we down tools. I looked to the others. I mean, I do anyway. Des and Liam mumbled agreement. The light in the fire flat the light in the fire flashed green as I tossed the last drops from my cup and waited till it settled back to orange to red and finally at the furthest at the furthest edge of the night to a dull, deep glow in a pile of ash. I sleep in the next day. I'm heavy on my right side as I wake, face pressed hard against the pillow. There's a tug of skin as I lift my head. The eye is glued shut. I find hot water in the kitchen kettle and hold a wet washcloth over my face. The hangover feels entirely concentrated in that one socket. Dehydration and infection and the slow drum of throbbing flesh, like it has its own heartbeat, like my whole center has shifted to this one burning orbit in my head. I ease the softened pus off in stages and then 
find a round, round gauze pad and some medical tape in the first aid kit, double eye drops, a makeshift patch, two paracetamols, and one ibuprofen. Liam brings food and water, makes coffee. He sits with me as I eat, bouncing one knee, clearing his throat again and again. It'll be okay, I say. We just follow Christine's lead. I pause for a moment. It's the right thing to do. Yeah, it's not that, he says. He glances over the dig site. The knee starts bouncing again. Christine and Des join us for, and for a while we sit in peace together. It's Liam who breaks the silence. I'm worried about the remains, he says. I mean, we're here now. We can get them out, make sure they're properly preserved. If we do nothing, Christine cuts him off. I'm worried too, but things have changed. A man is dead and we can't go back over that line. We no longer have the luxury of remaining neutral. The phone rings and she walks with it to the office. She stops at the door, her free hand jutting out, pointing accusations at the rock face. I shut my eyes, press my fingers along my cheekbone, and when I open them, Christine has returned. She stands with us for a moment, shifting her weight from side to side, her jaw set like she's biting down hard. She stares at the ash of last night's fire. They're pulling us out, she says, and the throb of my eye beats out the silent seconds that follow. Des opens his mouth to speak and she continues. We're to leave the site as it is, leave the office, all of the fines, and just pack up our personal stuff. They want us in Senar tonight for a morning flight tomorrow. Des starts to argue. Whose decision was this? What the fuck do they think? And she stops him. We'll debrief it back in London and we'll take it further there, but for now, we're pulling out. She looks around at each of us. This is not finished. That much I know, she says. Now go and pack. My eye is pounding against the inside of my head. If I could squeeze a tear of frustration around its edge, I would. I walk to my tent, gather up my things. The silver pisky that hangs near my bed gets wrapped and stowed in a side pocket, and by the time I pull my case over the truck, I feel drained. Behind me, the sight lays open to the sky. Christine and Des load up their bags, and I look around for Liam. He's still in his tent. We're gonna go get food in Senar, I say, but do you want some tea for the road? I might boil up a quick kettle. I throw the door of his tent back, and he's there, sitting on his cot his clothes strewn around like a teenage bedroom. Fuck's sake, Liam, we need to get moving. Now come on, I'll help, I say, and I lean over to grab the crumpled backpack at the foot of his bed. When I look up at him, he's just staring back, silent, not moving. He looks down, beside him at the phone. Liam, he coughs. He won't look at me now. He runs his finger across the keypad. Three, six, nine, the buttons click. Silver case, right against the dark towel that lays across the bed. He bounces his knee and I count. I start counting again like a cog has slipped. It'll reset itself at the next rotation. They need someone here to make sure the site gets cleared. The findings gathered and safe for... I'm at seven and I lose track. I can't tell if I was counting forwards or backwards. His knee. If I can push it still, lean down on it, we'll start this again. My eye hurts, and my head hurts, and none of this. They've offered me a deal. I can stay on and finish the salvage. I tried telling you, he says, and the blood in my eye is banging now. The debt collector's thump, persistent and loud, and he's talking, saying things about scientific resources and future legacy and gin and minerals, and then, it's then when I hear their name. The flash of the phone as the man in the suit turned to look. The security men in body armor that day on the road, and Asif there with the tributary of his own blood looking for its way to the sea and failing. Liam reaches for me with one arm, and I remember his voice, okay, 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 his eyes huge and brown like a children's cartoon, and I just leap. I'm bigger than him, so it's easy to pin him down with my knees, one hand on his chest and one on his head, and the sound in the tent is me roaring as my whole face now pounds with my eye, a taste of iron on my tongue. You're not working for them. You're, you are a scientist. You, 
Des's hands grab me under the arms, and when he lifts me off, the pressure pulls air into my lungs in a gasp. It comes out like a cry. He's, he's not, I try to explain, but the words slip back down my throat. I look at him cowering there on the cot, and it comes, that one tear, from behind the furious orb of my eye. Um, our next reader tonight, as I say, is, uh, as you know, Sarah Maitland. Uh, we're really, really honoured to uh, be finally presenting this book. Uh, this is book sort of grew out of a series of conversations and individual commissions that started maybe uh, four, five, five six five, years five, ago, five, five years ago. <laughs> uh, a long, long time ago. And, uh, it, it never occurred to me at the time that we would be able to entice such a fantastic writer to, to uh, spend so much time working so consistently and so brilliantly on, a, on an entire collection of stories based around this format. Basically, um, uh, Sarah goes, in each case, meets a scientist, um, has a conversation, very in-depth and usually very animated and energetic conversation with the scientist about a very, very sp specific area of research or theory, goes away, writes a story, checks it with the scientist, and then the scientist um, write uh, an afterward uh, a sort of commentary or response to the story, uh, explaining some of the science in it in a little bit more detail or context, and also responding to what uh, Sarah has done with it. Um, it's an absolute privilege uh, to have worked on this book with Sarah. Uh, she is a, a maestro of the short story form. Uh, she's also a maestro of uh, working with and modernising the bedrock of mythology and folklore and fairy tale, which the short story is built on. Um, and she, yeah, she's, she's ranked up there in, uh, in my eyes with, with Angela Carter and Amos Pyatt and the, the greats of uh, modern, short, uh, modern myth, mythology and myth making, although she's not like either of those two in any way, shape or form. Um, I'm trying to compliment her. Very, very well. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's, uh, it's been an ongoing project and we've done some events with her before but we've never actually had the book and it's a, it's a great pleasure and privilege and honour to finally have it here and to introduce you to Sarah Mead. Yes, there's lots of things I could say and probably lots of things I'm going to say because um, those of you who know me know I say a lot. Um, but some of the things I want to begin with are thanks to Ra, who has stood by this project for a long time. Um, thanks to, it's sort of really a book to, together with the King James Version of the Bible that <laughs> says that great art can be done by committee. <laughs> um, and that, to me that's very important. Um, there are the scientists. Um, who have been just unbelievably generous. We'll come back to that in a minute. There have been Ra and the people at Comma who have been unbelievably generous. Um, and there are my friends, especially Ford Hickson, to whom this book is dedicated, who have been unbelievably generous. Um, and the generosity is kind of needed. Niels Bohr, the uh, early quantum physicist of whom I have a um, a deep affection because he actually seems to be an incredibly nice guy and kept everybody talking to each other um, through some really difficult debates um, and was extremely modest about his own achievements. Later on in life, one of his students said to him when he was trying to explain what they've been doing, said, but um, Professor Bohr, I don't think I understand. And he gave them a big smile and said, no, we don't understand, we just get used to it. <laughs> and as for quantum physics, so for the generosity of one's friends. We don't understand, we just get used to it. And hopefully, we get used to it with gratitude. And this is a good occasion for that gratitude. And Ra sort of explained the project of the book, so I won't do that again. I'm going to read from one of the stories which is called The Mathematics of Magic Carpets. Um, and this story, I'm going to read from this story because it has slightly more sources than most of them do. Um, 
Professor Ian Stewart, the mathematical union, the mathematician, and history of mathematics, was the immensely generous advisor on it. Um, but it's also based on some of Jim Al-Khalili's work about Persian sciences that pays our proper debt to the Islamic sciences of the 8th and 9th century. Um, it's also um, one of the characters in it has brittle bone disease. Um, so that all that had to be researched as well. Um, she has brittle bone disease. Um, I'll read the story in a minute. But um, the story is about the invention of algebra. <coughs> and algebra, the word itself, any word that begins with AL and has anything to do with sciences, almost certainly comes from the Islamic sciences of Persia, um, like algorithm um, and algebra. But the word algebra means to um, straighten out or to fix, and it's the same word as you use for setting broken bones. Um, so it's used both in equations and bones, which is why um, we, know, uh, we know quite a lot, actually, about uh, the scientists who first defined algebra. Um, and uh, um, he's the sort of hero of the story. Um, and I'll just read, um, I'll just read a bit of it. Um, no, uh, one of the problems with reading from short stories, if the short story is any good, you can't read a bit of it. It all holds together in this beautiful, unbroken whole. But luckily, not all my stories are that good. So. <laughs> um, we'll make an extract. But essentially, um, in, in the ninth century, the uh, um, caliph of Baghdad um, had an absolute fascination with sciences, and he set up what may have been the first multidisciplinary research university anywhere called the House of Wisdom. And he had uh, invited a great number of scientists from all across um, the Eastern um, Eastern Europe, the Middle East, and India um, to come and work for him across a great range of subjects, but particularly sciences. Um, the idea was to develop or move forward um, science, which had been sort of static since the Greeks. Um, and one of the big, big breakthroughs was importing the decimal system from India um, through Persia. So bringing a decimal system to bear, essentially, on Greek geometry. And that absolutely changed what people had a capacity to do. Because uh, um, excellent and dignified, um, though Greek and Roman numbers were, they're not very good for computation. Um, you really do need an abacus, and shoving numbers larger than about 200 along an abacus get to be rather tedious. Um, so the discovery of what were called the Indian numerals, um, decimal numerals, allowed this enormous move forward in all sorts. I mean, in all sorts of areas because they just you can start doing sums really. Um, and uh, uh, the scientist who invented them um, called them the Indian numbers and. Uh, Show why and it's so much different. He moved on from the Indian numbers to do a number of uh, quite interesting things, um, and one of them was to replot the way you could uh, make maps, basically distances, which were much assisted by computation. Um, and that's why I'm going to take it up. In my story, though not in reality, Alcarisme has a daughter um, who is about 12 and who has brittle bone disease and who is dying. And when he comes in every evening from working in the House of Wisdom, um, he spends time with her and they sort of play games together. And uh, um, one of the games they play is pretending they have a magic carpet and can fly places. <coughs> so he said, we are all ready, we've made our map, we're all set to go, hold tight. And together they chant their summons Come you Jin from Solomon Tay, come you Horus from Paradise, come powers of air and movement of the sun, the Queen of Sheba calls you. 
to make her magic carpet fly to Cordoba. She closed her eyes and leaned against his chest, and they flew together in their minds, free and without pain, over the desert and the middle sea and the ruins of Rome towards Cordoba. Once the carpet was steady in the imaginary air, they were free to chat, although occasionally he would rock her suddenly or would peer over the side of the carpet and indicate particular glories that might be passing beneath them. They both knew it was a game and they delighted in it. <clears throat> Somewhere over Crete, she said suddenly, Father, the other day in the harem, the wives, her own mother had died in childbirth, she was free to load the word wives with a subtle sort of scorn. The wives were wondering why we did not make maps for people who wanted to go travelling. They said we would be very rich if you did. But on flower, we are very rich. Richer, she said. Well, you may tell them in the harem that their caliph, the ever-to-be-honoured Abu Jafar Abdullah al Mamun ibn Harun, would be mortified if one of his scholars were to set up a market stall. And that mortifying a caliph of his infinite grandeur and dignity is never a good idea. And it would be true. But there is a truer reason. If you have Ptolemy's lists, especially improved, if not perfected, by your unworthy father, and you follow the stage-by-stage -stage instructions that this same unworthy scholar gives you in his book, you can make your own map. You can go anywhere. You do not need to know and measure and calculate. You just need to follow the pattern of the instructions, and then you are free. My map would give you one good way to go, perhaps, but I want people to choose their own journey. I want people to know how to do the thing themselves. The journey is the unknown thing, the thing to be discovered. My way, you make the journey into a thing itself. A thing itself, the shay. The shay is the Persian and indeed early Southern European word for the X in algebra. And it just means the thing in itself, the thing to be discovered. A thing itself, the shay, and a method, a working method, an effective, finite list of well-defined instructions, and he could set people free. No, not just set people free, set the shay itself free. Detach it from numbers, even elegant Indian decimal numerals, the shay should be a free thing ready to be applied, like the coordinates were ready to be applied to any map. It was, it was his new thing, a new strong thing, but the energy of the Arabs and the subtlety of the Persians would come together, useful, enormous. He could, he would. Has the master of the place mark, the thief of the Indian numbers, fallen asleep, she asked? Certainly not impertinent child. <coughs> Were you to glance down to your right now, you'd see a column of smoke and dust rising into the air. It is an exploding mountain which throws up flames and rocks, and once upon a time it vomited up so much burning rock that two whole cities were buried and have never been seen again. But she wasn't fooled. If you haven't dozed off, then a science idea has swallowed you up. Is it a big idea or a small idea? I think it may be a big idea. Can I understand it? I hope so. That is part of the idea. He held her, rocking gently, carefully. Supposing I said to you that we each have a bowl of pomegranates, but we don't know how many. We do know that if you gave me one of yours, we will have the same number. And if I give you one of mine, we will, you will have twice as many as me. How could you tell how many we each had? She thought about it. Well, the first bit is easy. I have two more than you have in my bowl. And then? 
Well, I could get lots of pomegranates and try it out, but, but I could give you a list of things to do in the right order, which would set you free to find out the answer yourself, even if pomegranates were out of season. That does not, she said, sound like a very big idea to me. Well, my little pomegranate, it isn't. It's just an example. But it would be very useful for inheritance and measuring fields and building things and solving problems and measuring the stars and everything. And it works for every possible number. And whether it was pomegranates or stars or taxis or anything, the list of things to do, the instructions would be the same. There are things called equations. Things that equal each other. And we have lots of examples. Doing the maths with different numbers, worked out, solved little mysteries. But there are no general rules. And it will stretch our heads until we can count all the stars, even the ones we can't see. The Greeks did it by geometry, by lots of squares, but I will do it by order and reason. In my idea, the rules will not apply to the numbers, they will apply to the shade itself, the thing to be discovered, the X. They rocked in the garden while the sun sank and the shadows lengthened. She knew he was thinking, even as he, even as he was also loving her, she was safe. So she said, the Queen of Sheba is a little tired. We will not go to Athens today. If the man who counts the stars has had a big idea, we won't need those Greeks anymore. He tutted at her dismissal of the Greeks, but he wanted to follow his thoughts now, so they steered the magic carpet towards home. Just before they landed, he said, I will write a book for you. We will call it Al Kita, Al Mukatasa, Fi Hasis, Al Jibra, and Il Mukala. A compendium of calculation by algebra, she said. Algebra, but that means the setting of broken bones, the fixing of them. She knew altogether too much about that. Yes, he said, smiling down the top of her head. That will be our little secret joke, so that you will know it is your book. Jebra means restoring or completing something. You can do it to bones, but you can do it to equations too. You take a negative something, move it over from one side of your equation, the two parts that are equal to each other, to the other, and then it's restored or positive. The compendium on calculation by restoration and balance. It will be a very big idea. Forever in the future, school children throughout the world will learn about you, and they will not know it. You will be the shay, the thing to be discovered. Will it make me well, she asked. He wanted to say yes, yes, yes it would. But unlike losing a chatterange, that was not a father's privilege. There would be no more reverse cheating. He would not so dishonor her. After a long, silent moment, she looked at him out of her strange blue eyes and said, Never mind. I do mind, he said. She died that winter in excruciating pain in his arms before he could finish her book. He wanted to scratch out the title and call it something different, but he did not. He followed the custom and began the book with, in the name of God, the most gracious and compassionate. But in the copy he kept in his own house, he added in his own hand, for my Khalifa, blossom of the spring, sweet kernel of my heart, whose loss nothing can restore or balance. Dealing with uh, real 
historical fact to a certain extent in these, in these stories and in these projects. Um, and you're both, both bringing in sort of some theory as well and some, some, uh, some academia and research. Uh, in your case, Michelle, it was, uh, you, you consulted with a, uh, an archaeologist, uh, a couple of archaeologists. Um, and I just wonder what the difficulties are uh, when it comes to writing about real people and, and real history. So I'll start with you, sir. Well, the first difficulty is finding the people to tell you and write it that bit, and I think it's with that. Um, the second is uh, persuading very busy people to talk to you, and my scientists did that. So those are the two really big problems, finding the right people to talk to and persuading them to talk to you. So in one sense, it's all gift anyway. <laughs> Beyond that, I think there are can be problems about finding a shared vocabulary. I suppose, in a way, that's for me being the most interesting bit of the project, really. Um, I did work with, I did talk with more scientists than I wrote stories, because with some, I, the whole way this book worked was that I didn't have a story which I then checked up with a scientist. I had an area of science that I thought it would be fun to know more about, and then I would go to them and the story would come out of the conversation. And there was somewhere it just didn't work. You know, three and a half hours of conversation, three weeks of brooding on the conversation, no story. Bad. Um, but mostly, mostly it did, and that's partly because the scientists were terribly generous, actually. Um, so I think the main difficulty of the way I was doing it, which went beyond just the checking up, you know, it wasn't just I wrote a story and then uh, some of you who knew lots about it uh, said, well, actually, you can't do that, um, mm -hmm. or that's wrong, or mm -hmm. your dates are wrong, or um, actually, that's not what Dirac's equation says in the first place, or <laughs> those things. It was more of a much earlier start, if you like. Um, and yet, yeah, the difficulty is the word metaphor means to carry meaning over. I mean, that's what it means, <laughs> from Ferre to carry. Um, so it was finding a story that would be the metaphor, that would carry some idea from somebody else's um, creative world, that of cutting-edge sciences, of carrying that over into my own, which is about narrative. So, and that's the difficulty. But that's always the difficulty, you know? That's the difficulty. Think of a story. Easy, easy. <laughs> a, a lot of these stories uh, deal with kind of real life characters from history. So, as well. As yes. well. So, um, how do you negotiate? Okay, well, they break down. Some of them are, I mean, I think your word really was explanatory stories. They're stories about the discovery of something, usually historically, um, something that interested me. Um, and that, funnily enough, those are the stories that I like least. <laughs> um, I think some of them are, are fun, but the ones that I like more are the ones where um, the science idea, um, like in the story, has really got, um, has become metaphor. I mean, the, the story that started this project off, the Moss Witch story, um, which is about somebody who's, uh, it's about a bryophologist, somebody who studies mosses and legends, um, by the way, um, um, uh, encountering a, a moss witch. A moss witch is a human being who operates biologically the same way as moss operates. So, for example, old moss witches have uh, vertical rather than horizontal lines in their face because uh, mosses absorb liquid through these little runnels. I won't go there. Um, uh, there's also a story which is really about bird migration and is about somebody who falls in love with a bonk scene, which is a skewer. We get a, uh, uh, yeah, you know, so and I like most the ones that are um, where, that, where that metaphor has, has gone furthest. And in that sense, I find the ones on natural history easiest, which was interesting to me. So some basis some sort of knowledge did make the process easier. So hopefully now I know so much more than I knew when I started, I will have a wider range of metaphor to draw on. We have. Michelle, you, um, you have uh, quite a different task in front of you initially when you started writing this book, which was 
um, it's your own experience, it's your own kind of um, background, and um, how did you find the process of writing fiction about it? Uh, there must have been a number of challenges in Belgium. Yeah, uh, lots of challenges, but also, um, I don't know how I would have written it as non-fiction. Um, and I don't, I don't know if it would have been, I don't, I don't know. I mean, there's, there's, there's so many, there's so many interesting ways that, that, that people can write memoir, and I certainly don't have the, you know, I'm not at a point in my life where I could write a memoir that would be worth reading to anyone but my immediate family. I, I know that, that's fine. And, but also for me, um, I, you know, I'm, I'm a white British person who was working in a former colony of, of Britain um, during wartime. Um, and I, I didn't want to only speak about things that I could see from my perspective. Um, uh, you know, just the whole, like, you know, the whole white person's tears thing. I, I, I didn't want to write about that. Um, and and also through fiction. I mean, there's a number of reasons why fiction is, is really was, has been really helpful to me um, to to be able to uh, not speak for anyone else, but to try and imagine other positions um, to bring in a complication of which any war is full full of complication. So to bring that in, um, also. Um, there are things that are possible in fiction that are that are not possible in nonfiction, and um, particularly, you know, in a in a situation where so many people are at risk and and insecure, and most of the people that I worked with are and were, um, that it's it, it's it would be well, in my opinion, it would be unethical to to write, you know, to put people at risk for the sake of writing something. So so fiction has served a, a protective purpose and. Kind of pushing myself um, and you pushing me further <laughs> away it's from my own experience, you know what I mean? <laughs> and that and that's been really that's that's been so helpful. And it's like the further that I manage to get from my own experience, the the more I feel like there's something worth writing about in these stories. And, and yeah, and to go back to the um, the the research with the speak to archaeologists. Um, that was really interesting for this story um, because it was, I didn't know what the story was going to be. I knew the site because I knew um, the, you know, the mountain and the, you know, we spoke so much about that, that particular site in Henry Welcome's Day. Um, but I didn't know anything else and just decided I'm going to meet these people who know lots and lots about their field, ask them questions, as many as they will tolerate, and um, and then let that lead the story. So that's where it came from. I, that, you know, like you, I didn't have an idea like, here's my story, I'm just going to check it out with these scientists and get them to rubber stamp the idea for me. Um, no, and the interesting thing was that actually there was a huge range of opinions. Um, some, one person particularly that I spoke to was very concerned with the ethics of archaeology and we had a long conversation about, um, about um, people having archaeology done to them versus people doing archaeology with archaeologists, which really mirrors um, attention that's happening with regards to humanitarian aid work all the time. Um, so, so this was the perspective he was coming from, and um, you know, really questioning like who, who is, is, is doing what with, with what pieces of earth and remains of bodies and who do they belong to, and you know, national boundaries changing over the last 2,000 years, and, and all these kinds of questions. Um, and then um, some of the other people that I spoke to were very um, kind of, I suppose, removed from it. And their perspective was, well, if I'm working with, say, remains that, that exist that are held in a museum in, in Britain, I didn't go and take those out of the earth in Sudan. They're, they're in a museum in Britain. I'm now going to the museum in Britain and using them. There is no ethical dilemma. And that was their viewpoint. So there's this huge range of, of disagreement and argument. And that's what I wanted to write about in the story, um, was these different opinions and, and archaeologists being forced to, to, to I don't know, make a decision, to, to, to have to make a decision. 
Um, I guess the million dollar question, uh, which is possibly the hardest to answer, is so you've done all this research, you've become an expert, or a temporary expert in this, in this very uh, recondite, obscure particular thing, uh, or you've tried to. Um, what do you leave out? What do you include? And what do you exclude from your, from your story? I don't even want to start that. <laughs> This is a slightly uh, round the corner answer to your question. The best bit is when your scientist reads your story and says, that's really interesting, I've never thought of that before. Well, it has happened to me twice, one was about uh, um, tectonic plates. And uh, um, um, one, one, of the story, one of the stories in this book is called uh, A Geological History of Feminism, um, and it's about tectonic plates, among other things. And, uh, and uh, Dr. Kirsten, the first who was the advisor, said that she had never, before she read the story, understood the difference, although she knew what it was scientifically, between destructive and constructive plate boundaries. Um, which absolutely, I mean, she knew what the difference was in terms of the physics of the tectonic plate movement, but she never really kind of thought about the two different things that were happening at these two different plate points. And that is deeply gratifying. Um, the other one was uh, um, it's the one about the Bonsi, the skewer that I mentioned earlier, um, and which um, again Dr. Furness said uh, um, afterwards, he said, you know, we have been talking about that in our common room. He said, actually, it's such a neat idea. In this story, because the uh, skewer is sort of uh, a bit like a selkie, you know, a seal woman, except it's a Bonsi boy. Um, he's in, indirectly employed, um, indirectly because of the way skewers function in the real world, um, he's indirectly employed checking out fishing, um, the fishing boats, the dumping, um, you know, dumping dead. Because of the quotas, you know, people did a lot of dumping, which is why they changed up, so you catch a whole lot of fish. Um, your hole's really full, and then you hit something which is of higher value but of limited quota, so you throw over overboard the cheaper ones. Well, because skewers only feed on dead fish, um, they follow dumping boats. So this, this skewer is employed really to go and uh, uh, show which boats are dumping. Okay? So, uh, they're, they're chipped, aren't they? They're yeah, but they're, in the story, they're chipped, yes. In the story, in the story, on the whole, most people do not have sex with skewers. <laughs> Certainly not happy sex with skewers who speak in gay. Bit of a problem. Um, so it's a, all I'm saying is it's a real story. It's not, I'm not I think it's a real story anyway. Um, and then what you leave out is all the stuff you don't need. That's what, you've got a story. Um, so that what you're looking for is those bits, those chunks, if you like, of information that simultaneously make the story work. Um, I mean, it is an absolute fact. Let's just stay with these skills for a moment. It's a really simple example. Um, when they toughened up the Northern European dumping moves, the skewers started to fish, to spend the winter off Spain and Portugal. Now, because the whole of the EU is they start to move down to West Africa. That is simply a fact. Um, and a very interesting fact for bird migration people, because it's exactly the opposite from what you'd expect from bird war. Right? An unexpected reverse effect. They're very excited by this, and they've got these dear little sat navs which you attach to your skewer, so that eventually you'll be able to see what it's doing in real time. They used to do it with just the computer chips, but of course, Computer chips, which told you where the latitude and longitude of your bird was. But first of all, the bird has to come back so you can get the computer chip off it and download it. Which is a bit of a snag, um, rather extravagant as well, as so you have to put an awful lot of computer chips on to get any data at all. And secondly, and this is a really great bit, because the way they work is by measuring how much sunlight and darkness you've got during a day, they don't work at the very moment that the birds are night grating, they don't work at the solstice. Right? Because the days and the nights are exactly the same thing, or over the hemisphere. Uh, um, 
sorry, I got rather deflected. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is, you don't put all this stuff in, you have to know more stuff than you've got, and then you choose us according to the requirements of the story. That's what I'm that, well, carried away by having a happy sex life with a bomb seat. Yeah, I, I found myself writing, 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 and cut, 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 right to the point where if I start cutting anymore, this isn't a story anymore, it's just going to be a, a poem, a long poem, <laughs> and that's when it's <laughs> But you see, I think that that's what the scientists do as well. Mm. This isn't the arts thing, I think, and that's one of the things I find most interesting about what they were saying is, yeah, um, you have always got more dark data than you need for your whatever it is you're trying to do. Half your job is getting rid of the, finding the unwanted data. No, we can't calculate everything with every minute. Well, for coherence, otherwise, yeah. Were the, uh, the advisors and consultants always uh, open and, uh, and responsive and happy? I know there's, there's one in the room, at least. Neil's here. Neil's here. Story um, is uh, currently a, he's a PhD student. He's he's about to publish his PhD, um, but because of the really sensitive nature of his you know his material about this mountain, he's the one kind of person who seems to be working you know studying Jebel Moya at the moment that I could find. Um, he's very you know understandably reluctant to share too much information with me. He's he's an early career researcher, so. Um, so, so it was this very careful negotiation <laughs> went on and, and kind of continues to go on um, with him and, you know, I respect that, that's, that's what he, he's working on, so I, you know, it's anything he, he has, you know, decided to share with me is, is, has been really, I've been grateful for it. You know. Well, I really want to say something about that. I want to say what I think us on the art side, which probably might include art on can jolly well learn from the scientist is their phenomenal generosity with that material because that's the method. You, know, you publish early, so, I mean, of which the, uh, uh, the super speedy neutrinos are a beautiful example. It didn't make any sense, didn't know what to do with it. You publish at once. You know, as a matter of fact, I was, uh, was rather less excited in the newspapers. It turned out it was a uh, misconnection in an optic fiber and perfectly normal neutrinos, really. Uh, but the point about it is, is that publishing early, that willingness to share, that willingness to be wrong. Um, and that it's better to get the stuff out there and that whole kind of continuous running peer review stuff that um, I am appalled. I am, having worked on this book, I am appalled to compare the generosity of research scientists with with the generosity of uh, individual art workers, we're just vile to each other. I do have to say, whenever I say this to any uh, scientists, they all roll their eyes and say, you have no idea how nasty you are. they always wanted to be nasty. But I mean, just people were so generous, you know? Um, and yes, of course, I, I wasn't working with anybody from um, uh, the pharmaceutical industry, where we might have had a little less generosity, perhaps. Um, but I was really endlessly struck, seriously struck, by this willingness to have your ideas explored and prodded. I can't imagine doing this sort of book with anybody except scientists, because I think if you tried to do it with fellow writers, um, the hell they tell you what they were up to. <laughs> um, and I probably wouldn't know them much about this one. Because there's a whole kind of tradition of competitive secrecy, which is not very good for us, really. I don't know, great, you know. I mean, if I could add up, I'd probably start to be a scientist. <laughs> yeah, me too. Want to be a scientist? <laughs> yeah. Have you guys got any questions? I'm going to throw it out. Did they want to make a lot of changes and how did you negotiate that and keep doing negotiating? 
What was it like? Well, the question for people at the back who couldn't hear was how did the scientists in practice respond to the stories? For me, it was more interesting finding out more about the story than the scientific basis, because this was the one about Jacob um, wrestling the angel. And, um, this was a big jump for him. That in Genesis, uh, for people who don't know, but Jacob goes in for a sheep breeding scheme to breed only spotted sheep. He's entered into a contract, which is that all white sheep will go to the herd owner and all spotted sheep he gets to keep for himself. And uh, in, in, the, in the original story, um, it doesn't exactly explain how he pulls this off. But so I kind of did a reverse thing, trying to figure out how he could have done it theoretically. And then looking at how sheep were actually bred in the first place, and then it was quite interesting thinking about how the sheep in the Bible is probably the first example of how people were selectively breeding thousands and thousands of years ago, and there's, it's barely alluded to, but, but it's actually there. So it was quite interesting reading up a lot of that and completely different to what was actually given. And that's it, positive. Neil had a great line, please note, which I'm just going to read you. It's <coughs> so charming. Um, which he says, uh, we really entered into the kind of fictional, the whole fictional thing, he said, Using this knowledge, a clever breeding program by Jacob and Rachel over the seven years would have increased their sheep considerably, uh, but how could they have grown their flock to biblical proportions? Um, then he says, uh, uh, the details given by Rachel to Jacob and therefore us are somewhat limited. Maybe she wanted to keep control of the technical aspects by not sharing too much with Jacob, a man not necessarily famed for his trustworthy. <laughs> He's doing really modern research stuff. I mean, right up to date. Yeah, from like you were quoting papers from 2007. <laughs> yeah, to deal with Jacob's problems with his sheep. <laughs> and, uh, um, yeah, she did keep, uh, what's the word for it? She was very quiet about her protocols in my story. It's a little hard to know what paleo, you know, what caveman um, genetic breeding protocols would be. But Neil has some better ideas. Sometimes people did say you can't do that. Sometimes it's just factual, the date's wrong. I've got in a real date muddle, just I mean to be absolutely terrible, about uh, Heisenberg and uh, Schrodinger had a big fight, and I just put the papers in the wrong order. And uh, uh, Professor Al Khalili, Jim Al Khalili, who was advising on that, just very simply said, You can't do this, this narrative will not work because the facts are right. <laughs> <laughs> Which is lucky, really. It stops me going through the so, summer. Uh, Occasionally, and these were the ones that tended not to get written, the scientists had too strong and clear an idea of what story they wanted me to write. That was quite an odd one. And people who clearly had engaged in the process because they had pre-imagined the story. Um, and sometimes I was just too stupid or too... No, I'm never too stupid. <laughs> um, I didn't have... I could not get it. Some of them were really, I mean, in some of these stories, I was, one of the reasons why I was excited is I was absolutely worked out on my own um, intellectual limit. I mean, there's a story in here about Dirac's equation that uh, proved in abstract the existence of antiparticles. Well, I'm with Bohr, you don't understand it, you just get used to it. <laughs> um, Tara Shears, who was the scientist, kept saying, I love this equation, it's so lovely. Oh, this is such a lovely, lovely equation. I'm going to leave these things with me. Yes, So, So with that, then, do you grasp, do you grasp the piece that has some kind of image, metaphor, or something that speaks to you, and like you say, the rest, I don't understand it, so. Well, I think, I mean, the Dirac one, that would be a very good example. Um, I'm not going to explain the whole thing about the Dirac equation, but um, it, it was an equation to explain how electrons move. I mean, it turned out to be more, a great deal more than that. Um, and when he uh, come up with it, it had two answers. It should only have had one. It had a negative answer as well as a positive answer. And everybody said, 
this is just kind of gamesmanship. And he said, this equation is so beautiful that it has to be true. I'm holding out for it. I'm holding out for antiparticles and everybody gets it. Well, just stuff it there. Uh, and then, of course, four years later, now they're looking for them, they find antiparticles. Um, I never really understood how it got there, um, but Torres said this thing about it. He said, well, you see, the anti antimatter just, antiparticles just dropped out the bottom of the equation. <laughs> and that's such a kind of, and I'll show you a picture of the equation afterwards because it's, it's hard to see, but yet I could just see these little equal signs and something dropping out the bottom. It, like a crumb. Yeah, it became, it became a usable yeah. image just because she said something that, it, so basically it's a story about identical twins. Um, uh, because the thing about antiparticles is exactly the same as particles, except they're completely different. <laughs> uh, I mean, and nobody quite knows why, what's caused them to be so different. There ought to be the same number of them in the rock, you know. It's like, Tara thinks the most interesting thing to research in the whole world. But if you get something to give you an image that, that just kind of works. So I don't know what understand would me. I couldn't do it myself. Me and Dirac don't have a lot of uh, um, commonality of knowledge. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, the Just a small question to both of you. Michelle, any idea why the, the war short revolution isn't in the media anymore? And to Sarah, could you shed any light as to uh, how a minus and a minus makes a plus? As a matter of fact, they're the same question and they've got the same answer. Look at lovely. Why are we not hearing about it anymore? Because um, when, uh, how do I say it? It's, it goes, it, there isn't a kind of definitive start date, but, but it, what's referred to as like the current conflict. Um, escalated is the language that gets used. Escalated um, severely in 2004, beginning of 2004, um, middle slash end of 2004. We heard a lot about Darfur in the news, um, and then uh, at the end of 2004, there was a huge tsunami uh, that killed many many people around the world, um, and so there, there's the news cycle. So it dropped. It dropped off of the, the front page. Before then, it was being referred to as the world's worst humanitarian disaster. Um, so I think the news cycle is part of it. I think that um, also, when the, that escalation happened in 2004, at the same time, uh, South Sudan, which is now its own country, um, was fighting, I think it's 28-year um, war for independence from, from Sudan, from Khartoum administration. Um, and that had been going on for a very, very long time. Um, and there was more focus on that, which is part of the reason why the kind of build up to the escalation in Darfur wasn't, wasn't, wasn't very, uh, wasn't written about much, in, certainly in the media that we receive in Britain, um, because there was a focus on South Sudan, because the idea that there can be multiple conflicts happening in the same, within the same national boundaries that might be linked, but are not necessarily obviously linked. It's too much to handle. It's too, you know, um, because although you know, I said that the the conflict in Darfur is still ongoing. Um, there's also um, there's there's also massive. Um, I don't even know what word I should use. Huge, huge human rights abuses happening in Kordofan and South Kordofan, which are which are bordering Darfur. That's been going on for the last several years. I think also in the Red Sea state and, and like north, like right in the north of the country, the northwest, there's there's also massive human rights abuses happening, and these these things are are not explicitly connected to each other to Darfur, to, to, but you know the the common link is is the Khartoum government. So we have I haven't read a single thing about any of those in any of the newspapers here, and even looking online, it's not easy to find. So. Um, yeah, I I don't know. Does that answer the question? <laughs> it's it's a hard one to to get my head around. And it's something that when I when I did arrive back in the UK, 
I was just curious all the time about what, what you know, it just it didn't, it didn't seem real to me that it was so invisible. Um, but also, I, I understand um, that it's not, it's not possible for an individual to, to kind of be consciously and mindfully holding at all times every huge situation that's happening in, you know, I, I have no idea what's happening in most parts of the world, right? You know, there's so many things that, that I don't know. So I think that there's, there's that as well. Um, yeah, it's very complicated. I, I don't know if that's the same answer that Sarah would have given about <laughs> two minuses. <laughs> Go on then. <laughs> Was the question why I thought the two minus two negatives didn't make a positive? What would the I, I call me an idiot, but I've just uh, studied maths. So when the teacher said that, I, I just couldn't get my head around it anymore. Okay, it's a great but story. Like, metaphorically, like two negatives turn into a positive. Or what? Okay, it's a great little story about that, which isn't my story, but it's a good enough story to tell, which is um, some teacher is saying. Uh, isn't it interesting how uh, two negatives make a positive, but two positives don't make a negative? And somebody in his class goes, oh, yeah, yeah. Act. <laughs> um, we don't understand it, we just get used to it. <laughs> I don't know. It's, I love I love those very simple statements when people to whom they clearly make abundant sense say them, and you don't notice until 24 hours later that it was completely incomprehensible. <laughs> um, if people say things with enough authority, um, there is a hideous tendency to believe them. Um, I have never investigated how many negatives it takes to get to a positive because I really don't. Um, I think, I mean, with maths, it's always difficult, isn't it? Because of that whole formula stuff, you've got to have these axioms in order to play with it. You've got to, it's like monopoly. When you roll the dice, you've got to take what's on the dice. There is a certain element of mathematics which is formula game. So if they're going to say that two negatives always make a positive, then two negatives always make a positive. That's, you know, if you land on this square, you have to go to prison you do not pass go and you do not collect 200 pounds. Two negatives make a positive. Um, so there is no why? There well, probably is, there probably is a why. Who knows yeah. the why? Well, somebody knows. All right, tell us the why. Do you want a microphone? It's not always true anyway. <laughs> You owe your bank seven pounds. I owe my bank seven pounds. I'm in debt by seven pounds. So I have minus seven pounds. Uh, you have ten pounds. How much richer are you than me? Seventeen. Yeah? yeah? You're seventeen pounds better off. So the difference, so the first negative is how much more, which is take away. So it's ten, take away seven. Take away minus seven, which gives you the seventeen. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm only reading this is an open mic session. Anyone, anyone who knows the reason for a singularly straightforward scientific fact is very welcome to come and explain it. Thank you. <laughs> any other Have you got any questions? Anyone <laughs> so explaining scientifically or mathematically? The thing is, Ra actually knows the answer. <laughs> It's funny what you talk about when you say um, Dirac's maths produced, dropped out the bottom of it, negative particles as well as positive particles, so antimatter as well as matter. Uh, he said, you know, it's there in the maths, and everybody else said, uh, just forget about that, that's just a byproduct of maths, that's, that's just fiction. Uh, with maths, if you want maths to explain anything, for example, really simple things like simple harmonic motion, the way a, a pendulum swings, or 
anything like that. You have to have a solution to something which is, called, which is the square root of minus one to make maths work. And there is no square root of minus one. The square root of one is one and minus one, but the square root of minus one doesn't exist. So maths has to invent an imaginary number. It's called i, little lowercase i. It's called the imaginary number. And so the question is, is this real? I know it's not real, it's imaginary. But <laughs> what, is it, what does it mean? And maybe dropping out of the bottom of maths is the imagination itself. Who knows? I don't know. I'll leave that with you. Which is also a self little <laughs> Anyway, away from maths. <laughs> Any more questions? Yeah. <laughs> cool. Well, um, it, uh, there's, there's plenty of an opportunity, plenty of opportunities to talk and continue asking questions uh, to uh, the two writers. There are copies of uh, uh, Sarah's book at the back and some other common books. Um, uh, it remains for me to thank a few people. I should thank uh, the Manchester Literature Festival, which is going on. It's been going on for a week and a half, and there's still um, five or six days left of it. Uh, do grab a, a copy of the brochure. There's some. Fantastic events happening throughout the week. It's pretty non-stop as it always is, uh, but it's a fantastic festival. Uh, well, Comma has a, another short story event here on Thursday at 5:30, which is an appreciation event. Uh, two lectures or master classes being given by um, uh, Alison McLeod and Jane Rogers on uh, Dostoevsky and Catherine Mansfield. So if you're interested in short story generally, uh, do come along to that event. Um, and yeah, I should also thank uh, Will Carr and the Anthony Booth Centre. But uh, finally, could you join me uh, in uh, thanking the, the, tonight's two fantastic uh, readers and speakers, Michelle Green and Sarah May.